Hi, I'm Dr. Chad Larson, and this is Keep It Real. Keep It Real is all about real talk based on my 20 plus years of clinical experience. What we're really talking about is real food, real medicine, and real change. Hello, and welcome back. Today, I'm going to share with you a case study, and I'm bringing this particular case study to you because it's actually a very common scenario. This is a 52-year-old female patient, postmenopausal, with really no major health concerns, although I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, the main reason why she is consulting with me is because she has elevated cholesterol, and she just kind of wanted a second opinion because based on um, how high the cholesterol is, um, her primary care provider was suggesting that she go on a statin medication. So, and she wanted to know what my opinion about that was. So I said that the markers that were provided on this panel were insufficient for me to make that decision. So what were part of the panel? So what the markers included was uh, cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. That's a typical lipid panel. Uh, they also looked at a CBC, which is complete blood count. That's red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, et cetera. Also a CMP, comprehensive metabolic panel. This basically, this basically gives us uh, electrolytes, kidney markers, liver markers. I believe there was a TSH on the panel, a thyroid stimulating hormone. That's a thyroid marker and then uh, vitamin D. So um, I explained that those were insufficient because we need to take a little bit deeper dive, especially with regard to things like inflammatory markers and to some other cholesterol lipid markers that give us a more nuanced understanding of her particular risk. So I ran those markers and it actually laid out um, a very different story. So yes, her cholesterol was definitely elevated. And yes, her standard LDL was definitely elevated. In fact, I looked at another LDL called LDL Direct, which is different than the calculated version on a standard lipid panel. And it was certainly elevated, but this is where the nuances really get important. So I looked at her small LDL, and um, most labs want that to be below like 50. I want it to be below 25. And she was even below my more conservative number. She was at 21. So... That to me was uh, a healthy uh, amount of the small LDL, which is the greater you know, cardiovascular risk marker, but also small LDL is more vulnerable to oxidation. So I'm already a little bit less concerned about her total LDL being elevated because her results uh, suggest that mostly what she's making is the large version, with the, which is what the liver is expecting. And the large version of LDL is really not as susceptible to oxidation because it gets metabolized very quickly because it's recognizable by the liver, but the small version kind of flies under the radar a little bit and is more prone to this inflammatory process called oxidation and is more vulnerable to being uh, pulled into the blood vessel walls and causing inflammatory problem. And it could be the onset of cardiovascular disease. So she actually had a pretty healthy lipid panel despite the fact that her LDL total was elevated. She had some other important markers that, that give me greater insight into her overall, overall cardiovascular risk. There's a really important inflammatory marker called high sensitivity C reactor protein. Hers was as low as they report. So that was a very positive finding. Her triglycerides, which most labs report up to 150 is within normal reference range. I actually want my patients to be less than 90 and hers were uh, 50 something. So well below even my more conservative range. And her HDL, what I, which I want to see up in the 60s, that's a sort of our so-called good guy cholesterol, hers was 94. So I plugged her H, HDL into a number of ratios, and it was all actually quite favorable. So um, her overall cardiovascular panel uh, from a cholesterol standpoint was actually not as bad when we took the deeper dive. There was one marker from a cardiovascular risk uh, situation that was uh, concerningly elevated, which is homocysteine. Homocysteine could pose a risk for a number of things. Um, you see it in the literature for cardiovascular risk, but also for things like uh, brain and neurodegeneration, neuroinflammation. Homocysteine, just real quick, we could talk for hours just about homocysteine and its connection with a, a really important process in the body called methylation. But basically, homocysteine is our window into evaluating how somebody's uh, methylating. Methylation is very, very fundamental, foundational process in the body. It's a little bit too complex to discuss in this quick video, but basically the higher a person's homocysteine is, 
the poorer their methylation. So she had some uh, elevated homocysteine. And I explained to her that this is an important marker that can uh, explain to us her degree of methylation. But then we also discuss is actually a pretty easy marker to bring back down. There's just some very specific uh, methylated type B vitamins that we can prescribe to help reduce the homocysteine, thus increasing and optimizing her degree of methylation. So that certainly is a part of her overall protocol. But there are a couple other interesting things. She, by the way, is very lean and from all outward appearances is fit. However, when we looked at her blood sugar markers, she has some surprises in there. Her hemoglobin A1C is elevated. And then a calculation that I do called HOMA IR was also elevated. And these indicate that she's running into some blood sugar dysregulation. And let's bookmark that. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But this is actually a cardiovascular risk from uh, a little bit different standpoint from, from cholesterol. She's starting to develop some metabolic issues, even though if you looked at her, you wouldn't think that she has any metabolic issues whatsoever. And this is why it's important to take a deeper dive with, uh, with some of these biomarkers so that we can have a more nuanced understanding of a person's overall risk. A couple other things were, I think, really pertinent in her case. I look at omegas very thoroughly, and there's a particular omega-6 marker called arachidonic acid, which was uh, quite elevated. And that coupled with her main omega-3 uh, EPA, icosapentaenoic acid, which is part of the building block of our natural anti-inflammatory system, hers was strikingly low. So then we look at those in a ratio, uh, the arachidonic acid EPA ratio. We want that ratio to be closer to 10, and hers was 159. So the scales that are supposed to be balanced in her omega-6, omega-3 ratios, arachidonic acid EPA ratio was way off. She was in much, much more of a pro-inflammatory situation. So I mentioned before that she really didn't have any health concerns, but on further discussion with her, she actually is concerned about some uh, memory lapses and focus issues and what she calls brain fog. And we actually found multiple markers that could be associated with that, including this imbalance of her, of her omegas, uh, the blood sugar dysregulation that we found, uh, the elevated homocysteine can be involved in that. And then the next section, which wasn't evaluated at all, in fact, the last few things that we just talked about from the hemoglobin A1C, the homocysteine, the omegas, and then the following thing, the hormones, none of this stuff was evaluated by her uh, primary care provider. So all this stuff was completely missed on that evaluation. And what we found in her hormones is basically she has pretty significant deficiency of all of her main hormones. Her estrogen, estradiol was low, progesterone was low, DHEA in adrenal gland hormone was low. The other main adrenal gland uh, hormone, cortisol, that was low as well. Um, as was her testosterone. So uh, we really needed to do some uh, bioidentical hormone balancing, which, which we initiated. So uh, back to the idea of her blood sugar dysregulation, her diet is not terrible, but there's certainly room for improvement. And as we teased apart her diet, we found out that she likes to consume Skippy peanut butter. And, uh, we, I brought up the ingredients of Skippy peanut butter, and we could see that some of the issues that she's experiencing could be coming directly from Skippy peanut butter. There's some other things that we, that we had to tease out of the diet, but omega-6 can come from these sort of seed oils, and omega-6 seed oils are actually quite high in Skippy, and also sugar, I believe, is the second ingredient in this peanut butter. So where we are upgrading her her nut butter sources as a snack that she likes to have. And then uh, with, with the, the dysregulation of her, of her uh, glucose, in her case, it wasn't so much that we had to make really significant changes to her diet, but, but lately she has not been exercising. Actually, for, for some time, she has not been exercising. So part of the way that we're going to improve her blood sugar metabolism is to get her muscles moving because she's, she doesn't have insulin resistance. Uh, her insulin was actually uh, within normal reference range, but she has this elevated glucose. Her muscles are just not very efficient because they're not being used appropriately 
to dispose of the excess glucose. So this is one of the ways um, that, that we're helping her to dispose of glucose is just to get her muscles working. And she's starting to bump into a little bit of kind of post-menopause sarcopenia. I think the early stages of it, but this is a really good time in her life to, to, to make appropriate changes to really mitigate further progression of this uh, type of sarcopenia, which, which is muscle deficiency. And it's this muscle deficiency that is allowing her uh, blood sugar uh, to dysregulate. And she's not disposing of the glucose as efficiently as she will in the future. So uh, I just wanted to bring out this case because there are some shortcomings, let's say, of the primary care model of a fairly superficial evaluation. And by the way, she's taking, uh, she was prescribed a medication called Celexa for what I would call a post-menopause anxiety-induced insomnia. And it is actually helping with that. But let's think about this for a second. Let's take progesterone, for example, which was very, very deficient in her. Progesterone, which is a natural hormone that the, her DNA and her biology is expecting, um, dropped quite a bit in post-menopause. And this could also lead to those same symptoms of post-menopause-induced anxiety associated insomnia in other words not sleeping well because of racing mind and uh, anxiety type type feelings and she was put on selexa for this where where we're probably going to go in the future is once we support these micronutrients and macronutrients in her system and support her uh, hormones to a healthy balance it's probably likely that we're going to be able to improve her overall sleep by uh, supporting these hormones, because we know that progesterone is very sleep supportive, and especially some of the metabolites of progesterone, like alpha and beta pregnandiol. So, so that would be part of her overall management, and hopefully, you know, a a chemical, a medication that that does not exist in nature can be replaced by something that her DNA and her biology is expecting. So. It's just a different approach. There are other ways, you know, other than the standard pharmaceutical model to treat these very, very common imbalances. So hopefully that just gives you a little bit of insight into um, some other ways that these biomarkers can be evaluated and interpreted and treated. So I will keep bringing you the information. Until then, keep it real.